it's kind of difficult to slide gracefully into um, some serious, um, genuine thoughts about this disease because at the heart of this disease, at the core of this disease, for every man, woman, and child who's experienced it, there is a profound, profound and debilitating heartbreak. And I, for one, uh, step back from it. I find it extraordinarily moving and uncanny. It's a heartbreaking experience to have to slowly come to grips with the fact that you have a chronic disease that is culturally, politically, and still too often, certainly in California, medically marginalized. And so I'm honored to be here to communicate a little bit about the experience of human beings afflicted with the second great imitator, the first being syphilis, another skyrapetal, spirochetal disease. As we'll hear more about the talks to follow, there are many manifestations of the disease from the, climb, the classic Lyme rash, Bell's palsy, arthritis, to more typical later stage symptoms, a profound fatigue, diffuse muscle aches, which a friend of mine with Lyme describes as kind of a traveling, pounding hurt that moves from one organ to the next and then starts a new round and in his case has gone on for years joint pain, feeling like your head is in a fog, which is actually a very gentle way to describe a terrifying experience. And sometimes Lyme can cause truly severe symptoms, paralysis from the infection on the spinal cord, a dementia-like experience, and even heart block leading to death. I have learned from friends and family that it often takes months or years for a doctor to even begin to wonder if perhaps the reason that their patient is sick again, does that maybe have something to do with Lyme? I've also come to learn that the testing is not perfect. You can have Lyme disease and not test positive. And so all of this, it makes me wonder what it's like to be a happy nine-year-old girl who wakes up suddenly one day and she literally can't get out of bed. She struggles unsuccessfully to stay awake in school and suddenly not feeling smart anymore. She stops raising her hand. She won't answer questions. And every time she's called on, she begins to panic. And she's in pain. She's really, really in pain. Her joints hurt, but they're not swollen, so no one can see it, but they hurt her. She's brought to a pediatrician and a mono test is done. It's negative. And so she's told she's depressed. She's nine. Psychiatric meds fail her and her parents begin to panic. So finally someone suggests a Lyme test and it suggests past infection. And the pediatrician isn't sure about all this, frankly, but God bless him, he goes ahead and he treats her. And her symptoms subside, subside and everyone is elated. Until three months later, she's, she's in pain again and she can't get out of bed. And this time she's told she's making it up to avoid school, which would be kind of understandable given the experience she had when she was previously symptomatic and school became kind of a dark experience. She became isolated socially. So new blood tests provide no answer. And the pediatrician says, but he doesn't believe it's Lyme because she was given the curative treatment. And now these headaches begin. Finally, finally, some friends suggest to the parents that they visit perhaps another doctor. What is it like for a nine-year-old girl to be plunged into a reality of mistrust by all of those around her? What must the heart break? feel like when your parents say you're lying? Or what is it like for a 40-year-old ex-journalist whose life is now circumscribed by the four walls of your room? You can no longer write a coherent paragraph 
and you are left with profound sensory alternations so that you can't tolerate normal sounds, normal light. These become an assault to you, and they further impair cognitive function. How do you sit there in your dark room and calm your once restless, inquisitive spirit into a solitary experience of confinement? You are a mother and a producer in Los Angeles, and you have battled Lyme disease for seven years, six of them undiagnosed. You have passed on this disease to your child through your breast milk. Your three-year-old has never, ever seen your real smile. The palsy has stolen it. Probably it will never return. What is it like to go from being in charge of, personally responsible for at least 250 people, to be responsible for multi-million dollar budgets and suddenly be unable to find Target, the one that you've been to a hundred times. What does it feel like when you realize that you have for the third time forgotten to pick up your child from preschool and when you do finally pick her up, you can't find your way home? How do you cope with the feelings of guilt the feelings of shame, the feelings of remorse, knowing that you have passed this disease on to your family. And finally, imagine the father unable to, literally unable to sleep at night because the stabbing pains are so severe and the anxiety is so overwhelming because he knows he will now lose his job as a dentist because he can't use his hands with the dexterity needed and although he got dramatically better with antibiotics, the insurance company won't cover the antibiotics anymore, and he has no more money. What does it feel like for these people whose lives have been so profoundly altered, who are in the middle of medical controversy, who are dismissed by the medical profession? Normally in this culture, I think, um, when in relationship to disease, whether the relationship be of support or patient, we somehow feel at least that we know where we are. We know something about our cancer. We take pride in having our mammograms. We take pride in quitting smoking. We take pride in going on the Avon walk. We boldly and comfortably look our 20-year-old sons and daughters straight in the eyes and ask them if their new boyfriend or girlfriend has had the AIDS test. <laughs> And if they say they haven't asked them yet, we threaten to cut off the credit cards. <laughs> it's very simple, right? Well, present company accepted. I do think that with Lyme as a culture, we still turn away. We kind of go numb and we, we hesitate. This turning away, I think, is directly related to this deep and threatening grief that Lyme disease introduces. It's a grief at the loss of innocence, ourselves, our own, our children's. Lyme disease wreaks havoc with our sense of security and our sense of peace in relation to our entitled and free experience of the great outdoors. But today, due to the care of Dr. Fallon here at Columbia, the care of Time for Lyme, Debbie and Diane, the care of LDA, Pat Smith. This extremely alienating, lonely, and heartbreaking situation has more than ever the opportunity to heal. The feeling of hope engendered by today's event is a precious thing. And all of you in this room who have been fighting so hard with such verve and brilliance need to let this day go deeply into your hearts and feel the peace of your accomplishment. The symposium is titled Research as the Tool to Solve Medical Controversies and this is what needs to be done urgently. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the many generous donors who've united their efforts to raise the funds necessary to allow these scientists at Columbia to focus and find the answers we so desperately need.